tax half year results presentation. Uh, while you read the fascinating disclaimer, I'll tell you who's in the room. To my left, I've got Dorian Devers, or Devers, uh, you decide. Uh, and Dorian is our new CFO, his inaugural results presentation, and uh, he's taking credit for the results. Uh, in the room, we've got Matthew Forbes, who you all know, uh, Catherine, who runs our corporate affairs, and Louise, our uh, treasurer and head of capital markets. We'll run through the presentation. I'll do top and tail. We'll then go to questions, uh, investors, and then media, and then we'll... Uh, do a round robin and see if there's any more tidy up questions. Uh, but onto the results themselves. Uh, uh, three features in the year. First one being, you know, fairly uh, important year for us in that third strategy element of ours, which is continued optimization of our portfolio. And that concluded with the sale of our Heroa and the Rock Gas LPG business. Clearly, sharply stronger earnings and cash flow. Uh, I think I said in mid-2017, we were beginning to see the supply-demand outlook uh, changing somewhat, uh, and we were repositioning our portfolio for that circumstance. And we saw through the higher price period, driven by the uh, lower hydrology and gas field outages, that our generation business performed really well. When we've come at a point of a strategic uh, pause point, which we knew we would come to uh, a few years ago when we went on this path, and we knew the conclusion of that would be, you know, the revised dividend policy which we've announced today. Uh, given the strength of the balance sheet, our future view on earnings, we're increasing the ordinary dividend payout uh, to 100% of operating free cash flow, and that means 39 cents for this year you know, significantly up on the prior year. Now, you'll all be wondering, and we'll come to it through the course of the presentation, what are the conditions around that uh, dividend policy? Uh, but it is an expected earnings payout or free cash flow payout based on expected earnings. Uh, we don't intend to vary the dividend if we have the normal variability that we have in our business of uh, CapEx and hydrology. Uh, any change in expected operating free cash flow, which is from performance or market reasons, we would signal through the dividend. Uh, the policy is to look through uh, any short-term variabilities in earnings and cash flow that might come from capex and hydrology. So a real target of stability in that uh, payout. I mean, that's really uh, the conversation around the next slide. We're moving from 80 to 90%, and we had that you know, almost as a transitional policy while we were bringing down the debt level. The debt level is now down, uh, and as I've just said, we'll move to 100% of un operating free cash flow payout, which the board is really interested in maintaining stability around. In terms of highlights for the uh, six months, uh, we've continued to maintain financial discipline with both uh, OPEX and CAPEX down. Uh, sharp improvement in customer advocacy. Our MPS metric, which I've always said is a portent for good uh, performance in our retail business, is up. Uh, we've got uh, great safety in the six months. Clearly, uh, the disposal of rock gas LPG, which had its own hazards, has contributed to that but we had zero injuries in the first half, and a continued uh, trend on engagement. And as I've mentioned, uh, in terms of shareholders, uh, the stakeholder group that we're largely talking to this week, uh, a 23% increase in the interim dividend. We expect those operational improvements to continue. You know, So we've given you targets for OPEX and CAPEX in uh, fin year 19 and fin year 20. Uh, still uh, confident that those are achievable. Uh, mention safety, mention customer advocacy and engagement. I think they're the cornerstones to that good performance. And you can see all of that together has increasingly uh, resulted in operating free cash flow that's been re returned to shareholders. In terms of what 
went on in the market in the six months, uh, despite all the you know positive news flow on decarbonisation and what that might do for demand, uh, demand has hit its tenth year of being flat, uh, and you know we've seen a little bit of variation in the six months with the introduction of the fourth pot line at the smelter, uh, but irrigation demand was significantly lower. Uh, Residential demand did increase. Uh, you might not believe it this week, but that was on the back of lower average temperatures in the month, in the six months. Sorry. If we think, if we think, what does all of that mean, and what are the indicators of what does this upcoming winter look like? We have seen a rise in uh, storage levels, but I think a couple of the charts here, particularly at the bottom, do show you how variable. Uh, the storage and hydrology has been. You know, you look at those uh, pretty coloured maps of the first half 18 and the first half 19 and look at the variation in rainfall and then look at the bottom right chart and you can see the variation in uh, North and South Island storage. And I think we're beginning to see a more normal, uh, more like mean pattern. Um, Obviously, the big news in the six months was fuel scarcity. We had major outages at uh, New Zealand's largest uh, gas field, which went into its planned uh, maintenance today, just coincidentally. Uh, we saw the market respond to that. Uh, I think the market worked. It sent the signals that uh, fuel, uh, particularly gas fuel, has a material impact on the electricity market, and the market showed that through price. Now, looking forward, I don't see, you know, a huge amount has changed. Uh, there's as much gas today as there was last September, albeit for a few months of production. Uh, we've seen the new major operator in New Zealand, being OMV, announce an investment programme. And I think as we uh, get through this power core outage for the next uh, two months, I think we'll see uh, a, a resume to more normal gas availability levels. But the story, in my mind, is that that reliability that we need from gas, which wasn't there, uh, is being signalled through the electricity price. And I would expect some response to that in terms of investment and contracting. The strategy has not changed. Uh, continue to focus on uh, being a really uh, top retailer with a safe and efficient generation business uh, looking forward to decarbonise New Zealand. Uh, we'll always be underpinned by uh, disciplined and transparent approach to our costs. Uh, and we took another level of transparency in the last few months, which for those of you who uh, make models out of our numbers, is probably a bit painful. Uh, but we are probably the most transparent uh, of the sector. And, uh, you know, we can't optimise our portfolio of assets forever. Uh, so, you know, we'll probably see less activity on that over the next uh, year or two. What does that strategy look like in terms of what you should see uh, and what has happened in the six months? Uh, we, uh, in the retail business, uh, have uh, excused the uh, language, you know, gone almost fully agile. Uh, which actually is making a huge difference in this market, which has an amazing cadence. We've seen that result in lower call center volumes, uh, much improved digital uh, interaction with us, uh, lower ICT costs as everything has gone to the cloud, and uh, more and more customers using the app. Now, if you were a customer, you think, oh, that's all very nice, but what does it mean for me? Uh, and in the last six months, I think you've seen a product suite developed by contact which uh, allows all customers to be able to ac access our best deals uh, well uh, and provide a lot of choice certainty and control to those customers the wholesale business we've reorganized a little bit as we mentioned in the uh, strategy day in november and in the full year results uh, the commercial and industrial team are in the wholesale business very much with a target to assist New Zealand businesses to decarbonise. Obviously, that's a long-term game, you know, some uh, limited successes in the year. You'll have seen us receive 
uh, ECA funding to help uh, businesses uh, trans, uh, transform their fleets to electric vehicles. Uh, but probably the biggest progress in the six months which we outlined in November was you know, the range of development options at Tohara, uh, which you know, is looking like a very competitive uh, asset, but of course uh, not for development right now. So with that, a uh, bit of a run around the strategy the last six months and uh, what that might mean uh, for shareholders. Uh, Dorian will take you through a bit more of the detail uh, and then I'll come back to uh, a few forward-looking statements. So over to you, Dorian. Thank you, Dennis. Um, it's great to be at my first um, Contact Energy uh, results uh, uh, presentation. Um, and actually, uh, contrary to what Dennis said, uh, it's actually, I'm finding it quite disappointing that I can't take any credit for, uh, for these set of financials, which, uh, uh, being honest, uh, I wasn't expecting to be presenting a set of numbers like this uh, coming into contact. Um, Dennis has already mentioned there have been a number of changes to our reporting. Uh, we've done it for the right reasons, you know, aligning off financial reporting to the new uh, business structure with CNI going into wholesale. Plus, we've made some other changes which I think uh, make uh, our business a lot more transparent. I think it was relatively transparent anyway. And I was just saying to Matt Forbes, our head of investor relations, I wish we'd reported like this when I was doing my due diligence on contact ahead of joining because it would have saved me a lot of time and effort. Um, so uh, with that, on to the, uh, the first um, slide, which is our statutory profit. That's up by, uh, from $58 million up to $276 million, um, the, um, driven by uh, a good uh, underlying performance, but also uh, the profits we've made on disposals of AGS and, in particular, rock gas. Um, we like to talk at contact uh, in terms of the business performance on a continuing and a underlying perspective because that gives the best insight into what's actually driving our performance. And if I just sort of step you through how you get there from the outside of the slide, the first thing we do is we adjust out rock gas, which was discontinued. Uh, big adjustment in FY19 because you got $167 million of profit on disposal there. You then back out our non uh, underlying topics, uh, which are the same, similar ones to, that we have normally, but we also have the five million of profit that we made on the AGS disposal in the FY19 number. And that then gets you to what we call the continuing uh, underlying earnings, which is up by $49 million uh, there you can see on the slide. Uh, $61 million of that is, is EBITDA, and we'll talk a bit about that in the next few slides. We're also seeing lower depreciation because we don't have AGS on our balance sheet anymore. Uh, lower interest costs you'd expect because of the proceeds that we've got in for those disposals um, and uh, uh, we uh, are charged for a higher tax uh, linked to the higher profits. Our uh, effective tax rate on our continuing um, uh, underlying business is, is in line with the statutory tax rate of, of 28% so there's no sort of fun and games happening there. So on to EBITDAF, um, this is the performance across our uh, three businesses. Corporate's not really a business, it's just in there uh, for completeness. Uh, first thing to say, you know, it's good to see both wholesale and customers uh, showing EBITDAF uh, improvements, but you can see the real um, driver of the, the growth is around the wholesale business. I should make the point that we came off a uh, dry uh, H1 FY18, and actually, with a move back to mean hydrology, you would have expected our EBITDAF to have grown by uh, $25 billion. Um, the fact that we've grown by more than that, I'll, I'll talk about in the next few slides. So in terms of our generation uh, costs, uh, they're down by $12 million. Uh, and the key thing here is they're down by $12 million, but we've still got the same amount of uh, generation available. And what's happened there is we've seen more renewable generation, and that's um, uh, allowed us to substitute out the, uh, the more expensive thermal and acquired generation. And you can see that neatly on the chart on the left side. Uh, hydro is up considerably. It's up, uh, we'd say, above mean. Uh, you can see their geothermal has dropped back a little bit. Uh, there's no structural changes or anything going there on there. That's just a Wairaki four-year inspection, which happened in the first half of the year. That's now complete, and you'll see geothermal go back to normal. Um, but the thing I like about this slide, if you look at the chart in the middle, you can see renewable costs have gone from 60 million in the first half of last year down to 59 million this year. So there's a bit of productivity in there, but 
to all intents and purposes, our, our renewable business is fixed. We've got all of that extra generation for free, which is why, as you know, we get so excited about when it rains. In terms of our wholesale contracted revenue, uh, that's up uh, by $7 million uh, year on year. I'll just talk to the $7 million first because that actually relates to the non-electricity part of the business. We're seeing higher steam revenue linked to uh, higher volumes, but also higher pricing. And it's good to see we're recovering the higher costs of carbon there. And in terms of the uh, other income, that's up. And that largely relates to our uh, voluntary market making obligations with the ASX, where we're in the money this year, we're out the money uh, last year. In terms of the actual electricity uh, revenue, that's flat, but there's two offsetting things going on here. What we've done uh, for um, CNI uh, in particular, uh, with it being a fixed uh, price variable volume part of our business, with the um, risk around natural gas supply, we took the decision to uh, pull back from that business a little bit. Um, which is from a risk mitigation perspective. It's proven to be a good decision financially as well because that's then freed up volume for us to go long in terms of merchant capacity uh, at those higher GWAPs that we're seeing in the market uh, in the first half of the year. Um, so what you can see is the, um, the two offsetting things going on here is you're seeing lower uh, revenue from those fixed price variable volume um, uh, businesses, but that's offset by higher revenue from our CFDs. So we are supporting TY in the fourth potting line, so the volumes are going up there, but also we're seeing higher pricing uh, as well, in particular linked to some short-term uh, CFDs that we've got in place uh, supporting other generators who would run short at times when the prices were high. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be forecasting that those prices on CFDs were going to continue into the future. And then where the, the big uh, improvement across our wholesale business has actually been around trading. We've seen the EBITDAF go up by $39 million. I've tried to actually unbundle this a little bit for you uh, here because it's obviously a significant number. And if you think about what's going on with the trading, the buying and selling with the grid, uh, sometimes we're long. And when we're long, in effect, it's a sales channel, a new sales channel to market. Sometimes we're short. And when we're short, in effect, we're buying um, uh, generation uh, to support uh, our business. And then the balanced trading, the buying and selling that's happening um, in the middle, uh, the financial consequences there are around the LWAP, GWAP and the location losses. So we've actually shown it like that. Uh, and what you can actually see is where we pulled out the length, we've looked at every single 30 minute trading period uh, where we are long and the price that we got when we are long, we've done exactly the same thing with the shortness. And you can see there the length has improved year on year by 102 uh, gigawatt hours. And also the pricing that we've got on the length has improved year on year by 77 dollars uh, per megawatt hour. So collectively, that drives uh, about $45 million of increased EBITDA. So there's a few things that we can do to support that, and we did do. I mean, Dennis has talked about our uh, flexible asset portfolio in the past, and we were able to leverage that. So in October, we were able to extract more gas from the ground uh, and produce thermal into those higher pricings, uh, prices we saw in October. Uh, actually, we were scheduled to have our four-year inspection at Wairaki in October, but we were able to safely defer that to allow us to continue producing. And I'd already talked about what we did with CNI, which obviously freed up uh, some volume to go long in terms of merchant. So there were a few things that we could do to sort of influence uh, uh, the, the outcomes there. In terms of shortness, the good thing here is you can see we are very rarely short and, and spot exposed to the market in terms of uh, buying generation. And when we've gone into a, a period of more price volatility, it's really good to see that that's been locked down even further. So we've actually only had one gigawatt hour of spot uh, exposure there to the, uh, to the grid. Uh, and that talks to the good risk management processes that we've got in place. Um, the LWAP, GWAP, uh, for a sort of balanced trading position that we've got going on there, the spread on that has increased a little bit. It's gone from 6.2 to 6.7%. Uh, I put that down to the fact that we've had less North Island generation, uh, so less thermal. Um, the, uh, the impact of that spread increase normally wouldn't be that significant, but what's happened is because we've got higher prices in the marketplace at the moment, when you apply that percentage spread to those higher prices, it actually comes up with a bigger location loss. So we've seen uh, an increase in location loss of $10 million. So hopefully that gives you a bit of insight, uh, maybe a bit more than you've had in the past around the wholesale business and uh, what's driving that $58 million EBITDAF improvement. So next on to the customer business. So here we've seen uh, revenues down by $2 million, EBITDAFs up by three. 
Um, the revenue uh, shortfall is we've seen uh, slightly lower customer numbers, which is obviously impacting our volumes. Although uh, we have seen customer numbers stabilise actually over the last three months, which is really encouraging. Um, but the reason why we can translate uh, 2 million down in revenue to 3 million up in profit is about we're starting to see a bit of tariff pricing coming through here, which is good. We've got $2.20 per megawatt hour increase in tariffs there flowing through for electricity. And actually that then widens uh, when we get to a gross margin perspective. So we're up by $3.10. And that's because we've seen uh, higher, uh, sorry, lower network costs. Almost said higher. I think uh, that's what we've seen in the past. Uh, uh, we're in an unusual situation at the moment. Uh, and then we've doubled down on that because you're still seeing the cost efficiency program with the cost of serve. You can see there the green block coming down from 41 to $40 uh, million. So you've got pricing, cost reduction across networks, and then cost reduction across cost of, uh, cost of serve, driving that $3 million. In terms of our overall cost uh, reduction program across contact, that's continuing to pro progress well. You can see there the downward momentum. On average, our other operating expenditures dropping by about 6% every year. The headline number's down by $4 million, uh, but we've actually given you an underlying view of it because you'd expect our um, other operating expenditures to drop because we've shed those two businesses and the associated costs with them. But the other thing that we've had in terms of an on-cost is because of the outstanding financial performance this year, we're having to provide for increased incentives. If you back those two things out to get a like-for-like -like sort of underlying view of the numbers, we're down by $6 million year on year, which is about a 5% reduction, which is there or thereabouts with the 6% trend that we've seen downwards. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of insight into the sort of topics that are driving that number down, we're continuing to see uh, savings around the ICT part of our business as we move more sort of applications to the cloud. We're continuing to see uh, bad debt levels uh, reduce, and we think some of that uh, is linked to the new plans that we've got in place with the market, which uh, make it easier for our customers to manage uh, manage their customer uh, their cash flows, and therefore less likely to get into difficulties. And we've got a leaner organisation, which obviously reduces the uh, the labour costs. So we've done all of those things, and actually that six million is net of some investments that we've also made around our brand that you'll be aware of, but also around in investing into digital. So we're on track to sort of hit our guidance for the year, uh, which is about 200 to 210 million dollars. In terms of cash flow, um, that's that's performed well. Uh, we're looking at this from a total contact perspective here, not just a continuing perspective. Um, EBIT DAF up by 55 million, but that's actually translating into a uh, operating free cash flow, which is up by 62 million. So some really good cash conversion there. Uh, trade working capital is is positive, so we've managed our trade working capital down. Some of that is actually about the fact that we've net extracted gas from the ground, and obviously, when uh, in the future when we fill back up uh, the storage facility, we'll have a cash outflow there that we do need to deal with. But we are, as I talked about earlier, seeing better collection rates and lower bad debts, which is playing into lower trade receivables. We have seen tax up uh, year on year, and that's actually about the wash ups from. FY17 wash-up that was paid in FY18 was quite low, whereas FY18 wash-up that was paid in FY19 uh, was, was a more normal level. So that's drove, driven the tax up by $20 million, and that's partly offset by the interest savings. Stay in business capex is lower uh, year on year. We are expecting it to ramp up a little bit in the second half of the year uh, as we stay on track with those customer and wholesale projects, which are going to deliver even DAF improvements into FY20. Um, and in terms of our overall uh, stay in business capex, we are still forecasting that's going to be in line with the 65 to $75 million uh, guidance previously given. And um, Matt's provided in each chart on the right hand side that sort of reconciles to our historic 75 million uh, average uh, expected capex down to 65 million now, which reflects the fact of uh, AGS and uh, rock gas coming out of the numbers. And just to finish off the slide, you can see the free cash flow there is up by half a billion exactly because that includes the proceeds on the disposals. So we've had a lot of um, a lot of sources of cash in the first half of the year, a lot more than we normally have because of the uh, the proceeds and also because of the good uh, operating free cash flow. Where has that gone? Obviously, we've uh, paid a final dividend for FY18 in uh, September, but the rest of it has gone uh, to shore up. Uh, our balance sheet or strength on our balance sheet, I would say. Um, and that's actually shown neatly on this slide. You can see on the left, our net debt has reduced uh, over a half a billion over the trading period. And you can see the impact that's having on our uh, net debt uh, to EBITDAF ratio. It's dropped from 3.1 
to 2.2, uh, and that's on a um, S&P adjusted basis. So they bring AGS back onto the balance sheet, uh, and the thoughts are that they'll continue to do that until uh, first guests sign up other long-term customers. If it, if it wasn't on the balance sheet, we'd be down at about 1.9. Um, our average uh, interest rate percentage has been dropping down neatly. You can see it did actually tick up. That's not because we've restructured debt and uh, uh, agreed to pay more interest. That's around uh, uh, mix. And with the proceeds coming in, we had to pay down our variable debt because that's the ones that we're allowed to pay down. Uh, and that tends to be at a lower interest rate than the fixed. Um, with refinancing and uh, as we rejig our interest rate swaps, we'd expect to, uh, to get that uh, um, back in line over the next uh, uh, few months. And I guess the last point to bring out on this slide is the uh, we've got a $222 million retail bond that's due to uh, mature in May. One of the things we're looking at at the moment is um, uh, the potential to refinance that with a $100 million uh, retail bond. We haven't made any decisions on it, but uh, I wanted to give you a heads up on that so that you weren't surprised if and when it happens. Um, some of the reasons why we may decide to, to look at doing that is um, we have paid down a lot of debt uh, recently and we've got some cash outflows coming up in terms of paying the tax on the AGS disposal. Um, plus, Dennis has already mentioned the, uh, the new dividend policy. So it might be prudent to do that to maintain liquidity buff buffers. Um, you can see there the tenor of our debt at the moment is 3.6 uh, years in total. Uh, it would be nice to, to push that out a little bit. So if we were able to do a retail bond and get whatever well, five years worth of tenor on that, that could take us up to about, about four years. Um, I think the last thing uh, is if we did do a retail bond, uh, it would be the first, we'd be the first corporate in New Zealand to issue a, uh, a green retail bond, which obviously plays very neatly with our decarbonisation strategy and green credentials. So with that, I'll hand back to Dennis. So well done, Dorian. It's only been in the uh, seat eight weeks and has clearly uh, got a handle on the numbers. I mean, I'll make a few uh, forward-looking statements and then we'll go to questions, but there's only a few slides. Uh, I'll repeat the strategy slide because I think it's useful to anchor us in the customer and wholesale businesses you know, we spent a lot of time in the last three years uh, getting it really clear that these two businesses operate quite differently uh, at different paces uh, and have slightly different objectives, uh, but both focused on cost and efficiency. Now, the first thing people ask when you put a slide up which says near term, medium term or long term is what do the dates mean? And... Uh, try working through a dividend policy with a board and figuring out what average expected medium term means. Uh, so I'll be a bit clearer. Near term means stuff we'll probably have be able to report on in August, and medium term is after August. Uh, so the priorities for the next uh, few months, clearly contracting gas uh, will be important to us, uh, given uh, the upcoming winter. Uh, having said that, I do believe that once the current uh, planned outages are complete uh, and as I've mentioned with OMV's clear interest in uh, making the most out of the business they've acquired from Shell I think we will see gas availability and reliability improve. Now we do have a very good risk management framework so we'll be able to manage any volatility and obviously we'll be looking at alternatives to gas such as gas in storage or other contractual arrangements. We'll continue to deliver customer value. Uh, clearly, the electricity price review will be taking some of our time in the next few months. Uh, we believe we've created a product suite now which allows all customers to access our best deals reliably. Uh, the next proposition we will release, and by imminently, uh, I mean this month, is a basic plan. Uh, that's a no prompt payment discount offer uh, competitively priced. Uh, so one of the questions in the electricity price review was around PPD and I think that will be the last product that satisfies all of the uh, questions that might be there from the electricity price review in terms of uh, customer products. We'll continue to execute on the cost and efficiency mm -hmm. program. Uh, we will uh, continue to go after those targets 
uh, we described at the full year results. Uh, importantly, we will, I think, make good progress, and by we I mean FlexGas, on the commercialisation of gas storage. Uh, and you might be thinking that's so we can get it off the balance sheet, but actually it's really important for security of supply. And I think really important in a decarbonising world to have secure, flexible gas supply. And, you know, September, October, November give us a, gave us a taste of that. So getting gas storage fully commercialised uh, with its expansion, which is continuing at a pace, the expansion will be complete next year and gives a really important short-term objective for us. Uh, in the longer term, we'll continue to uh, push our decarbonisation strategy, which has multiple limbs, uh, you know, making sure that our geothermal developments are the best developments for when the time is right. Uh, and they may be deployed either for the substitution of thermal generation. And although the swaption contracts are not up till 2022, uh, you do have to start planning these things a couple of years out. So uh, you would expect us to be working on that later this year. But also, you know, the expected increase, real increase in demand. But I think that's going to come from large commercial and industrial customers first and uh, a lot of work there on partnering with those. Obviously, shareholder value is going to come from improved earnings, and I think improved earnings can come from capturing scale efficiencies, whether that's developing the low-risk, low-cost uh, brownfield geothermal, or leveraging our excellent customer systems and increasing customer advocacy into a larger customer base, whether that's energy or adjacent products. Now, if you want to look a little bit more at the conversation on the wholesale market and some of the options for New Zealand, we did run quite a large investor day in November and the links provided. Uh, but what does this, you know, this is a results presentation, so we talk about results and we talk about what that means. So uh, in terms of guidance, uh, nothing has really changed from uh, August. We will continue to go after and these are midpoint numbers, uh, $205 million of OPEX this year and 190 next year, uh, 60 to 65 in CAPEX. Uh, as the transactions have settled, though, and we've looked at the balance sheet going forward, then the only real change is that we've added a line called cash interest, and that cash interest is probably slightly higher than you would have been thinking but all within, you know, the rounding of the discussion last August. And just to finalise, uh, the distribution policy in its uh, full form, uh, and I'll reiterate that the policy is to distribute 100% of operating free cash flow, uh, and we'll use the balance sheet to ride any variability in hydrology and capex. Uh, we will continue to target triple B, and we will continue to have a sustainable financial structure through multiple scenarios. Uh, dividend payments, as before, are expected to be split 40% uh, in April, 60% in September. And to the extent we have imputation credits, then they'll be attached. Uh, we're a little bit short of uh, our imputation credits for the next couple of years, so there probably will be a little bit of prepayment. But to make it easy for shareholders, we decided that the imputation level of two-thirds, which we foreshadowed a couple of years ago, is what we will guide. So 100% of free cash flow, 39 cents, two-thirds imputed. And with that, uh, I'll go to questions. And we'll probably take uh, investors in the room first, and then we might go to the phones. Andrew. A couple of questions, if I can. Yeah. Um, I guess kicking off, first of all, just around the, the dividend policy. And I seem to recall in the past you're talking about um, with uh, the, the level of gearing dropping down and having some surplus capital there and maybe looking at some sort of capital management policy um, in addition to ordinary dividends. Is that still in the thinking? Um, are we still waiting for the Ahura gas storage deal to go through? What, what's the. I, mean, I think there's probably a couple of things to say. One is, you know, we need 
a buffer when you're paying out 100% of free cash flow and you want to keep that stable and you have, uh, you know, we've previously described hydrology as being a $30 million risk and, you know, we could see capex variability with any plant refurbishments or drilling. So the first thing is you do want a buffer. Uh, so the board are, uh, are very focused on maintaining stability in the dividend and therefore that drives a reasonable need for a buffer. Uh, if decarbonisation uh, does drive uh, demand growth, and we can see that, and we can see thermal generation being substituted, then we would want to act on growth. Uh, but right now, you know, there's nothing to say on that. Uh, and I think it's important for us to see AGS off the balance sheet uh, before we were to commit in any way. Uh, so it's just, you know, again, uh, you know, I feel like I've been saying this for four years. Uh, you know, there's a bit of timing around this, and every time we can see certainty of improved distributions, we'll go for it, and that's what today is. And the 39th, 39th sense of share guidance, I'm assuming, takes into account the sort of the bumper hydro period you've just had in the first half. Yeah, yeah, we've normalised through yeah. to... The, I think in the full year results we said a normalised EBITDA of four eight. Yeah. So we've normalised to that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, next question I had was just around, I guess, the ASX futures prices, and, and they've been particularly strong. And, and I guess your commentary early on was that you see it very much being due to, I guess, the gas um, situation in that October, uh, November period last year. In essence, when you see the gas situation normalising, do you see those that long-dated ASX curve dropping down again? I mean, this, you know, if I was a predictor of this, then, uh, you know, perhaps you would be getting capital management. Uh, <laughs> the, I mean, if you, if you take a step back and go, what, in an underlying sense, has changed? You know, the P2 gas reserves that were there last September are largely still there, and there might be at a little bit of cost in moving those P2 reserves to P1, you know, contracted reserves. So, you know, you could see a little bit of a lift because the marginal fuel uh, is increasing. Uh, carbon, clearly, with the consultation underway on the emissions trading scheme, will be in those numbers. But because of the volatility, you've not been able to discern how much is carbon. Uh, technology costs are going the same way they've been going for 10 years, you know, so uh, wind has been getting cheaper, geothermal, as we've described in November, has been getting cheaper. So if I go back to the fundamentals and take the noise of the short term out, you know, you would expect uh, uh, a reasonable reduction, uh, but there might be a bit of underlying support from gas and carbon. And our last question for me, I guess, was just um, on the contracting for gas and, I guess, what sort of pricing you're, you're seeing um, in the market at the moment. Um, and obviously you're confident of contracting gas again. But yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see a lift. You know, I think our average price past couple of years has been about 5 eight -er. You know, you, you could see a lift north of that by maybe a dollar. Uh, I mean, it's quite interesting. I, y you look at what we bought on the spot market in January, which is in the operating statistics. So we bought half a petajoule on the spot market. And half a petajoule is quite a lot. You know, we're only mm. intending to buy, you know, 10 petajoules-ish. So half a petajoule is a reasonable quantity. And I think the average price was 640. Mm. You know, so in stress situation with an outage coming up. Yeah. yeah, and there was some chunky electricity demand in January, actually, through air conditioning. Uh, we're still being able to access the spot market at 640. So, you know, so I'm not expecting huge numbers. Yeah. Neville. Okay, uh, just a few. Into, you mentioned the network price sort of flatness. Uh, are you anticipating that'll rise? And I suppose, given the conversation we've just had about ASX, certainly the short term rising. Do you see upwards pressure on both CNI and probably more importantly through retail? Well, I mean, if you, I mean, I know we heralded a, an improvement in earnings in our retail business, but if you actually look at what customer credits went on the balance sheet, it was flat. Uh, you know, we put three million dollars more of customer credits through the IFRS 15 line. Uh, so, despite you know the most volatile wholesale market conditions, 
we've seen in a long time. Uh, new entrant retailers are still increasing their share, you know. Electric Kiwi are adding a thousand customers a month. And, and in essence, our wholesale, our retail business is only improving its performance through cost efficiency. Uh, so, you know, an increasingly volatile wholesale market, I don't think necessarily results in an increase in price for consumers. Uh, you'd have to ask the network companies what their plans are, but uh, you often see applications for customized price paths and billions of dollars of investment in networks, which, you know, at some point will go through to consumers. Um, and just to continue with the forward pricing theme, you mentioned um, substitution of thermal and, and potentially what other players might do on top of your yeah. own. You've been pretty clear, I think, about what you intend, which is to only build if you've got new to market load contracts signed. And, and our clear substitution of thermal. Right. Um, do you expect others might um, build or, or that there's going to be any pressure in the market over the next two years to, to start building out to um, remove thermal production from you know, the generators? There's probably a, you know, a few things. One is, you know, you give a man a hammer uh, and your large engineering companies like to build large engineering things, so there is a little bit of excitement that comes in when prices are a bit higher. But demand has been flat for 10 years, let's not forget. Demand has been flat for 10 years. Uh, so I think there'll be a little bit of you know game theory going on as to who can capture an investable uh, project. I think there's a... So that's probably number one, you know, the more subjective uh, comments around it. I think there is a real opportunity to uh, use the enhanced operation of the grid... Uh, and water storage and new energy to take out more gas and coal. You know, and if you look at New Zealand's, and obviously contact has been a massive contributor to this, you know, demand has been flat for 10 years, but renewable proportion has gone from 65% to the mid to high 80s. And, you know, we've all done good projects and maintained security of supply. So I think there is a real opportunity that that will happen. I think the puzzle is uh, energy versus capacity. You know, so new renewables bring in energy, but un 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 other than geothermal, run at lower capacity factors than a gas plant or a coal plant. So it's that energy versus capacity. So I could bring in 100 megawatts of geothermal, which would replace the energy that uh, TCC produces but 100 megawatts is a quarter of the capacity of TCC. So you've got this energy capacity uh, a puzzle to work through. But I think with a strengthened grid, uh, a strengthened gas storage facility and uh, water management, you could, you could work your way through that. And then the third limb is, can you get customers to sign up to long-term uh, low-carbon projects? And if you look globally, the last uh, quarter, I think we had... I'm going to say quarter, but it could be six months. In the world, 13 and a half gigawatts of uh, new generation was committed to by corporates. And that's doubling every year. You know, you've seen the likes of Sydney Airport in Australia commit to a wind farm with a firming product. So, you know, there is, there is absolutely, in my mind, uh, uh, an opportunity with our CNI portfolio. And we're absolutely screening our CNI customers based on decarbonisation opportunity. Great, thank you. And just one last question. Uh, I think we talked about the AGS, AGS tax callback yeah. at the time of the sale. Obviously, the tax payable was quite a large number in the balance sheet right now. So I think we talked about $48 million at the time of the AGS tax. Is that, is that still roughly the number of the callback? 45? Yeah. 45. Yeah, because okay. we only received 190, gotcha. uh, and we're going to fight for the other 10 <laughs> ad infinitum. Uh, Is there anything else unusual in the, the 70 odd million um, inter, you know, tax payable figure on the balance sheet? It's just unwinding. So unwinding of the deferred tax liability. So we've had a lot of projects that have been uh, quite short, uh, useful lives in the tax. For example, IT systems, SAP. Yeah. Uh, and the like, and then obviously as those as that unwinds, um, sort of tax payable rises. Good for imputation credits. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be something. Glass, glass half filled. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. And the big one uh, over recent history would have been SAP. Mm. SAP was on a three-year tax depreciation schedule versus 15 years on the balance sheet. Thank you. Any more in the room? Before I go to investors on the phone, then I'm coming back to media. Uh, anyone on the phone? And as a reminder, to ask a question over the phone lines, that is star one. And we do have a question from Aaron Ivinson with UBS. Ooh, <laughs> Good morning, Aaron. Hi there. Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Good morning. How are you? Good. Uh, I've got um, sort of uh, three questions, if I may, and yeah. apologies if some of this was mentioned. Uh, um, we had a bit of a bad line here, but uh, my my first question is, uh, and I guess you touched on it with regards to the um, FPDV CNR customers, where, where you said you'd pull back a bit from that business if I got you right. So I'm curious to, to understand. Uh, you know, let's assume that this wholesale price path continues and the long dated ones stay around sort of 1995 level or something. Your, your CNI and net back didn't really move at all between first of 18 and 19, uh, when sort of wholesale prices up 50 and short dated um, prices also up something like 50% and long dated up. So I'm just trying to understand what dynamic we should expect there if the wholesale prices continue to, to remain high. Uh, should I just cycle through my questions? Yeah, 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 go for it. Or do you want to answer that first? No, no, go. Give us your free questions, though. Yeah, Give my second... Time to think. <laughs> yeah, so secondly, um, you know, I just... You, you mentioned it a little bit, but uh, uh, let's assume that you manage to reclassify your uh, AGS debt in the next couple of years. Do I understand your communication correctly that we should assume that um, you, you feel that you have balance sheet flexibility to sort of come up with every, whatever solution you decide on Tauhara or, or otherwise uh, without having to, to sort of reduce your dividend, i.e. that you sort of have a bit of debt capacity um, to add uh, uh, growth capex now when you're not sort of accumulating if you're paying out 100%. Uh, that was my uh, second question. And finally, you did touch on it uh, when it came to gas going forward, but I wasn't 100% clear if you were referring to just sort of calendar year 19 or if you were talking about slightly sort of longer term. Do you think, you know, in the next few years we would move up from this? Call it six dollar level up to a seven dollar level, or do you think it's just a little hump now with all the issues surrounding availability? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aaron. So your first question: Why didn't C and I move despite uh, higher ASX prices? You're really only going to see it at one twenty six per month. The average contract length for C and I is twenty six months, and there are traditional contracting rounds. So, you know, November's a reasonable contracting round for a, an early calendar year start. So if the price stays up, then you would expect to see that reflected in C&I netbacks over time. But it would take a full 26 months to flow through. <coughs> in terms of, uh, you know, fast forward, a couple of years of 100% payout, uh, AGS is off the balance sheet, uh, and we're faced with, you know, we've we got this great problem of how to fund uh, a 10% post-tax cash return project, uh, then, you know, we would fully expect to be able to do that uh, with debt and we wouldn't need to disturb the dividend. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, that's a high-class problem at some future date. Uh, but absolutely, the dividend policy has been set to allow that flexibility. Um, the question on whether gas prices are up for the short or medium term, uh, I, I think they've probably taken a little bit of a structural lift. Uh, the investment to go from 
known reserves to contracted reserves and the reliability that comes from that has a cost and I would expect some of that to be reflected in the gas price. What we've got to figure out through our negotiations is how much is that. Uh, and, and it's quite possible that we may contract for a few years uh, and have some certainty of that over a few years. If you think that we're going to be in swaption replacement conversations uh, early in the new year or later this year, and, and we would be looking at the TCC major maintenance, it might be quite useful for us to buy three or four years of gas. Uh, and I think if we were to do that, then you might see a lower gas price because the producers have certainty. But I think we have got a little bit of a shift in gas prices. I just I don't think it's very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. That, that's very clear. Can I, I just probe on my uh, the answer to my first question on on C and I a little bit? Because even allowing for sort of the one twenty six movements, we have had a few months, and and uh, um, you know we've obviously seen it from the operating staff. So it's not like it's news today, but. I'll just take take the opportunity to ask of you instead of terrorizing Matthew. But you know, what? Why are we not seeing somewhat of a movement then? So, so if you write a contract, an FPV the contract today, you know, what would you accept, and why would you accept uh, a price that is similar to the long dated ASX? Because you know, you do have the variable volume, so you're effectively giving them. As far as I can tell, you're, you're giving away options for free, so they're not paying anything for the, the security of price when they can vary the volume. So I'm still a little bit surprised that we're not seeing a, a bit of an upwards movement on the CNI prices. I suppose there's a couple of things, Aaron. One is we haven't actually contracted very much in the six months. You know, uh, our winter support is gas fired generation, and we ain't got no gas. Uh, so, our uh, you know, this is a simple perspective on the risk management systems. Uh, don't sell what you haven't got. Uh, so we haven't actually contracted much in the six months, so you won't have seen much of a price uplift. Uh, I mean, I think any offer you would see from us today okay. would be higher than you would have seen historically. Uh, but these customers are pretty wily. You know, they look through short-term noise on futures pricing, and if they have a view that they're going to come down, then they won't contract. Uh, you know, so the jury's still out, Aaron, on whether this is a short-term effect and the market's a bit spooked because of gas reliability or uh, it's actually a longer-term shift. But refer to my earlier comments, you know, other than maybe a little bit of an uplift in gas and an uplift in carbon, the fundamentals have not changed, so... You would expect some flattening over time. But, yeah, we, I mean, our prices are higher for C&I today than they would have been uh, six months ago. But we're not contracting very much. So you're not seeing it in the numbers. No. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Next one on the phone. And we'll next go to Grant Swanepoel, Craig's Investment Partners. Hey, Grant. Morning, Dennis. Hi. Morning, Dennis. Morning, Dorian. Morning, Matt. Hey. Um, yeah, a few questions. Uh, first one's around controllable OPEX. Um, you've got to go from 223 down to 205. Um, do I have to add back the um, repayments, I mean, the staff incentives? And then on staff incentives, what's driving that? Is that share price? Is it earnings performance? Is it cost out? And then just talking about the 18 million drop in, in controllable OPEX this year, can you just run through that? Is it six million due to the Aroa gas storage going out? Something for rock gas, three million for rebranding. Back on top of that, etc. Just give some sort of colour on that one, and then linked to the controllable OPEX. Um, I'm just concerned that your your uh, guidance type of number for up free cash flow for FY20, talking about EBITDA of four eighty million. It, it, does that take into account the four eighty million of OPEX going from two hundred five million down to one ninety? 
So, in, in effect, you're talking about a normalized one right now of around about 465 million, or we're going to be reading too much into that number. You know, what's your assumption around gas costs for that number? Is there no retail pricing coming through to get your 480, et cetera? Can you please just clarify that 480 so we don't have any confusion out in the market? My next question is on the ministerial review. Um, there seems to be a lot of talk about potentially doing away with a non prompt payment discount. Um, or prompt payment discounts. How many million is it that you guys recoup each year for people who don't pay promptly um, that could potentially hit your, your, your income statement if that does come through? And then my final question is on gas retailing. Um, it seems to have had a, had a bit of a downturn on that. Pricing's off a bit. Is that expected to continue? I'd be su I'm surprised that actually your margins are, are, are declining on your, your gas retail market. That's it from me. Thanks. So uh, on this year's OPEX of 205 target, um, I mean, that might be a little bit up, you know, if you could be 207, 208, but CapEx is likely to come in lower. So the combined target of uh, 270, 275 is intact. Uh, the, uh, the bonus reversion to mean uh, is cash flow driven. The sixty percent of the corporate components of our bonus system is cash flow, uh, and thirty percent is EPS. So yes, it's the reversion to mean on bonuses. Uh, the drop from two twenty three to two o five this year, uh, rock gas coming out is eight. AGS coming out is five. Add back three for staff incentives. And then uh, we're looking at 10 total, uh, eight total, sorry, for uh, uh, operating improvements. And then I think if I go to the subsequent year where we've guided 190, there's another seven of uh, rock gas and another one of Ahuroa and then another nine of operating improvements. And I've not mentioned it here, but that you know steady state of uh, improving the digital nature or transforming our retail business to a technology business actually should see that 190 continue to reduce through 21 and 22. Uh, to the four ATA uh, question, Grant, and why have we come out at 480 and not reflected uh, any of the current operating conditions? I mean, I, th I think there's a few things to say. One is, you know, four months does not make a trend. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a, uh, a cost increase, I expect, on gas, but some or all of that should be passed through. We've got a little bit of an improvement uh, as a result of transmission costs. Uh, but I think it's just too early to be flagging uh, a significant or any increase in that 480. Uh, but what we will do when we see a, a systemic shift in that number and the subsequent cash flow number is we would signal that through the dividend level because the board are going to pay out a dividend on expected. In terms of uh, EPR, uh, I mean, I think prompt payment discount will be a feature of the solutions document on the EPR. Uh, we, and, and the figure you're looking for is how much uh, PPD is foregone, so how many customers don't capture their PPD because of late payment. I mean, it's in the order of seven or eight million. Uh, but there's an awful lot of cost in that process. Uh, and, you know, if we were to see a more uh, a regulated PPD, you know, where it's limited to a few percent, then I'm not sure you would see much of a difference in our earnings because we're just, uh, just around that simpler product structure. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it's a long answer, but, you know, the customer's who uh, 
love their PPD, got in touch with us when Meridian cancelled their PPD, pleading with us not to get rid of the PPD. You know, some customers like receiving a cost discount. Some customers like simple, no prompt payment discount prices. Some people like to pay weekly, fortnightly in advance. Uh, and we've developed all of those uh, options for customers. Uh, so I think actually taking PPD out of the mix isn't necessarily that customer centric, but I think it will be a feature of the EPR uh, results. And gas retailing is just mix uh, more small, medium enterprise customers versus residential customers who have a lower margin and a lower tariff. So that's just a mixed question. Residential margins are improving in gas. I think I got all of them. Well, thanks, Dennis. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I sort of follow up on anything else we should be expecting from the, the ministerial review and is something expected out this month? We are expecting a solutions paper, uh, uh, you know, next week, week after, keeps, you know, being speculated. Uh, that solutions paper, we understand, will be a, a, a series of one-page potential solutions, pros and cons, and then there'll be consultation on those. Uh, I think we're going to see, uh, you know, this is in speculation on my part, I think we'll see a lot more around education and advocacy. Uh, we will see something on prompt payment discounts. And uh, I think we may see something on market making arrangements in wholesale. But I think there'll be useful clarifications rather than wholesale change. But, you know, we've got to wait and see. Thank you very much. Thanks, Grant. Anyone else on the phone? Media and we'll next go to Stephen Hudson, Macquarie Securities. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Dorian. Um, uh, nice most day. of mine have been asked and answered, but um, just going back to the 2020 EBITDA guidance, have you factored in anything for the HVDC poll um, outage uh, that, that for, I think, the th first three months of that calendar year? Um, and then just secondly, on, on your unit carbon costs for FY19, can you give us a, a feel for what you've baked into your, um, uh, to your thinking, I suppose, for, um, for your EBITDA death for FY19 then? Yeah, the, on your first question, HVDC outage, uh, the, the risk management systems of, you know, essentially... I say forced, forced is the wrong word, uh, is to prepare for that and have uh, some North Island contractual support in place. So uh, we don't see any earnings impact of that outage. Uh, in terms of carbon, uh, the calendar 20 cost, because you know it's a calendar year, so it's always a bit tricky to figure out what your financial year is. I think fin year 19, we might be at 18, 19 dollars. Calendar year 20, we're at $21. And then calendar... Is that, is that your hedge position, Dennis? Yeah, we run out after calendar 20. Uh, and then we'll have to buy more units. Uh, we're, we're working on a few things which are direct access to units, which mean we won't be paying $25, but... A proportion of the units obviously will be at that sort of level. We've got to see what the consultation does as well. But fin year 19, 18, 19 right. dollars, fin year, calendar 20, uh, 21 dollars. Let's do it. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Man. And we'll take our next question from Jason Lindsay, ACC. Uh, good idea, Dennis. Um, just a okay. quick question uh, regarding the valuation of your generation kit. Um, Trust Power this morning flagged a decline in value driven by a lower Ford curve, and looking at the annual report, they were using just over $90 a megawatt hour real by 2021, which I guess in hindsight seems a bit aggressive. I was just wondering where you guys are at and if you're still comfortable with the assumptions. I mean, the, the board uh, consider obviously a whole heap of 
impairment indicators uh, in the half and the full year. Uh, I don't think we published this number, but our current impairment models at $72 uh, carried forward. Uh, so, you know, we, we take a pretty conservative view on, on our valuation model, uh, which, you know, wouldn't, you know, you know, I think if we had ninety dollars, yeah, we might be facing the same question. But we take a pretty conservative view, and we've got plenty of headroom. Great, yeah, thanks. It, it was a bit of a surprise, I have to say. But there you go. When you've when you're issuing a cleansing mm. notice for a bond issuance, then it makes you, you know, think, I suppose. <laughs> Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that could happen to you. Uh, any more on the phone? And there are no additional questions. No additional questions over the phone lines. Uh, we'll we'll go to I guess just Giles and Gavin and uh, yeah, any questions and then we'll come back to the questions online. We actually have one. You'll cover it later. All good. So we've got questions online, Matthew? Yeah, we just got one question online. It comes from Tim Hunter from the NBR. He asks, what options might there be to enable economic substitution of thermal generation with renewables, given lack of demand growth doesn't support new renewable investment? I think it's very much the reduced or curtailed operation of either some of the Huntley units or our Taranaki combined cycle plan. The next big decision point on that is 2022 uh, with you know preparatory work on that probably back end of this year, early next. Uh, and, and I can see a scenario where there is a bit of renewables built, there's uh, management of storage, both gas and water, and there's uh, use of the greatly unconstrained uh, grid. So I think there is an opportunity to take the next step in, uh, in, in renewable proportions in New Zealand, but what that looks like is probably a year away or so. So any, any more questions in the room? I think we're all done on the phones and online. So with that, thank you for your attendance and uh, no doubt see all of you in the coming days.